poverty, that's a tough one. It's a hard issue to even get a handle on. We ask, where, where did it come from, or where does it come from? That some people lack the very basics of life. That's an important question, but the more pressing question is, what are we going to do about it? It's, it's an obvious question, but one that perhaps we avoid asking if we can help it. But it comes to the surface from time to time. Maybe more importantly, what am I going to do about it? What are we supposed to do about it? It can be a very uncomfortable topic, hard to even talk about. Some people, for one reason or another, have, have some passion around wanting to address poverty, and, and, and the approaches can take a variety of forms. Some people are, are eager to figure out what's that next program that is going to alleviate some more of the poverty that's out there. And you might think of local programs or uh, uh, state government or federal programs. And you hear people who have worked with this, and they can acknowledge that programs have their limitations, right? Usually there's kind of a sweet spot um, with a new idea for a program where beyond that, maybe you lose some of the cost effectiveness or you begin to create perverse incentives and all the tricky things that can come with trying to create a program. But you hear people who are passionate about poverty and that's their approach and there is um, some real integrity to that. There are lots of ways to come at this. Um, you wouldn't be surprised, you know, if you talk to people, if there's some others who are kind of allergic to the idea of programs or at least more programs. But some of those folks are eager to find ways for their own money and possessions to get to those who most need them and are willing to talk to others about it, making sure some of their money and possessions end up with those who most need it. And so that becomes a position with great integrity also. Uh, but then there are, there are other whole ways of getting at this. I get to work in the, the circles of charities and nonprofits. And you'll see some charities that really feel like if we've got something and someone presents themselves in need, our job is to make the match and, and just give away the store as fast as we've got something to give and people present need, uh, you know, and these are the ones that are always running out. But they feel that's their mission, and I respect that. Other charities have wrestled with the fact that they probably can't help everyone and so they do a great job in many cases of figuring out how can we find the right person that we can come alongside in a life-changing way and make a real and lasting difference for this person. We can't help everybody, but we can find focused ways of really changing lives, and I have great respect for that too. What I think interests me the most um, as we, as we try to find promising ways to alleviate poverty is, is to get beyond, you know, maybe our most usual approaches and, and to talk to those folks who have the global perspective and are trying to say, how do we address poverty as a global issue? A lot of them begin with uh, health, right? We've got Lazarus in the story. We don't know about the sores, but maybe if he didn't have the sores, his life would be pretty different than it is. Um, medi medical care, access to medical care, affordable medical care. You know, the folks who look at the big picture of the world and say, what's the key? What's the key that will, will turn world poverty? Um, women's empowerment turns out to be a very effective one. Uh, different ways of, of giving women more agency in their lives. Uh, certainly financial services, access to financial services for the poor is a fascinating one, right? If you have a, a, a safe place to, to, store, to, to save a little money without a lot of fees and whatnot, if you have a place to get even a tiny loan when you need a, a loan to get something started can, can make a huge difference. Uh, education, obviously, is one of the big keys. How do we turn that in, in the world? It's a big issue. 
It's great. There are so many people passionate about it, working at it, coming at it from different angles. Um, biblically, there adds a, 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 an ethical dimension. And we, we see again and again the question, what do we owe each other as human beings, as fellow human beings? What, what do we owe each other? The prophets in the days of Amos want to ask, what do we as Israelites, even narrowing it down just to Israelites, what do we owe one another? And, and the prophets frame it primarily in terms of some inequality, a basic problem of inequality. They know that when God settled the people in the promised land in the days of Joshua, each family was given its own plot. Each family had a, a, a sustaining small holding, a small farm. And yet by the days of the prophets, there are rich people and there are people with nothing. And what has happened? The biblical call to address poverty, to struggle with this big question is clear. But Jesus' stories, you've probably discovered by now, Jesus' stories are never just about one issue. He can speak very plainly when he wants to about sharing with the poor, giving away your possessions, and he does. But this time he likes to tell a story. And I wonder if we might move through this story and just note a few details that will help us go a little deeper. The story begins, there was a rich man. And it's probably worth pausing just a moment to see who, who we should be identifying with in the story. I usually steer clear of statistics, but here are some interesting ones. If you're part of a family of four and you're in earning annually as a family, $60,000, you're in the top, I'll let you guess, what percentage of people in the world? You're in the top 8% of people in the world for income. If you're a family of four in the United States, you're earning $40,000 as a family. You're in the richest 14% of global human beings. And if you're a family of four earning $20,000, which is below the poverty line for a family of four, but it still places you in the richest 27% of people globally. So most of us, most of the time, should be identifying in this story with the rich man. If that doesn't do it, then take the next line. He feasted sumptuously every day by the world standards I feast every day. Some of you have done the local crop walk. It's a great event together with other local churches. We meet over at the Catholic church and walk across the dam. And when it's done, they serve us rice and beans. And they actually have a really delicious recipe for rice and beans. I look forward to it. Um, but if you're reading, eating something other than rice and beans today, again, from a global perspective, you're probably one who feasts. The story continues. It says, at his gate lay a poor man. Now, gate is a word with some biblical resonance. It's one of the things Jesus compares himself to in the Gospel of John. He says, I am the gate. But a gate is it's just an interesting observation. What's a gate for? Is it keeping? Is it there for keeping certain things in and other things or people out? Or is it there for going in and going out? And of course, the answer is both. If you didn't want to go in or out, you don't need a gate. You need a fence. And if you don't want to keep some things in and some things out, then you don't need a gate. You just need an opening. A gate is there for both of those reasons. But Jesus, uh, as he continues the story, he has us imagine uh, the afterlife for these two men. And I just want to pause here a moment and say, when Jesus is telling a story, it is never primarily to give us information about anything. And I think certainly in this story, not to give us information about the afterlife. If you want to hear Jesus talk more directly about the afterlife, there are places for that. Turn to John 14 um, and some other places. Here he's using actually some kind of cultural tropes, some, some 
uh, ideas about the afterlife that would have been familiar to the common person, that the righteous are in the bosom of Abraham um, and are feasting, uh, and that others are in Hades and perhaps with some aspect of, of punishment related to their life. This is something, you know, this is sort of the Looney Tunes version, honestly, of the afterlife, right? Um, uh, where, where Jesus is using it to make a point, and always then to make a point about life. And he says, in the afterlife, there's a chasm, and there's no crossing back and forth. And that, of course, is there to make a point about life now, where there's not a chasm. There's a gate, and gates can be opened. So back to that gate. The poor man's name is Lazarus, and it says that Lazarus longed to satisfy his hunger with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. You know, those who look at global poverty, um, one of the clear keys that's there for us to turn global poverty is food. And if you talk to anybody who's, who's made this their life work, they'll tell you that for the past several decades, um, it has no longer been an issue of enough food. The earth produces abundantly. Um, our economy supports that production. It's not a matter of, there, is there enough food? It's a matter of distribution. Can we get the food to the people who need it? And here's Lazarus, knowing there are crumbs that would satisfy his hunger. This is something that I guess uh, may have been common in the first century. Uh, those who do archaeology at the city of Pompeii, that city that was frozen in time uh, in the generation after Jesus and his contemporaries, by, it was frozen in time by a volcanic eruption. And so as that is excavated, we see what was, life was like on a certain day um, back in uh, the first century. And at some wealthy homes, there was even a bench by the gate. And on feast days, when, when people would know it was a holiday, people inside would be feasting, the poor could come and sit on this bench, and as the dishes had been passed in the feast, they'd be brought out to the poor. One hopes, perhaps even still warm once in a while, that they might um, partake in this way. And this was expected of the rich, part of the privilege that came with being rich. And here's Lazarus, and he'll see he's still waiting even for the crumbs. Well, then they die, right? And Jesus uses this image of the afterlife to reveal the inner workings of what was happening in this life while there was still a gate to be opened. And the rich man reveals so much when he says, Father Abraham, have mercy. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in the water and come and cool my tongue. It reveals so much, that one line. First of all, even in death, even in death, how does the rich man see Lazarus but as someone to order around? Even in this moment where Lazarus has been gathered to Abraham's bosom, the rich man is still stuck in this way of seeing Lazarus, as, as the philosophers would say, seeing Lazarus as a means to an end, someone who could make something happen for someone like me, rather than as an end in himself, right? This rich man is still seeing two kinds of people, the kinds of people who serve and the kinds of people who get served. And Lazarus is one kind and he's the other kind. But there, there is only one kind of person the kind loved by God, the kind of deserving of dignity. Lazarus is an end in himself. Abraham knows it, God knows it, but this man can't see it. But even more than that, his words indict him in yet another way. You all come to church, you've heard the gospel read, you've done Bible study, you know Jesus likes to tell stories. How many times, in all the parables of Jesus, how many times does a character have a proper name? I'll just let you do a mental inventory. Right? A sower went out to sow. A woman took a little yeast and hid it in three measures of flour. 
right? A father had two sons. Usually, there's not a proper name. In all the stories of Jesus, there is, in fact, one proper name. It's in this story. The poor man's name is Lazarus. And it's so important that he has a name. Abraham knows it. God knows it. He has a name. And the rich man indicts himself. He says, send Lazarus with some water. The rich man knew his name. This isn't about solving poverty. This is about a relationship between two people who knew each other. And that relationship could have been so much more. Now, if you listen to Jesus long enough, yes, address poverty, struggle with that. What are we to do? And we are to do something and to bring our best. But Jesus makes this story not about those things we can kind of throw up our hands about and say, well, I don't know what to do. He makes this story about relationship. Who are the people who's, who are suffering from want that you know? Who are the people suffering want who you could know? Jesus simply wants us to acknowledge our share as humanity. There aren't rich men and poor men. There are human beings. Jesus wants us to acknowledge our shared humanity and to experience it as we connect with one another. I heard from Deacon Andrew, we're working on a, a, a service trip for the youth this coming summer uh, to a program called WOW. And it is... Um, it is a kind of service that kids haven't done before, where they're interacting with people in poverty. So they try to prep kids for what they're going to see as part of this uh, work trip. And when, what they tell them is, if you meet someone, you know, perhaps in a, in a state of poverty you haven't encountered before that makes you uncomfortable, the first thing you do, even if it's the only thing you do, is you share your name and you ask their name. And there is, if nothing else, then a shared a moment of shared humanity, an acknowledgement of the humanity in one another. Wanting to know someone's name can change the dynamic. I served for a couple of years at a, a downtown church, and I was sort of the pastor who was in charge of interacting with the people who came in with various needs. And there were all kinds of needs that I couldn't address, some that we could, but I hope everybody who came through there got at least a handshake and an invitation to sit down in my office and an exchange of names and probably a prayer. And a lot of needs had to be left in God's hands, but at least they had that, that moment of connection. Jesus is just inviting us to be human together. And what a gift it is. For some of us, it is going to involve discovering some humility that we have forgotten along the way. But what a gift it is. My favorite meals are those shared meals where you, in the course of enjoying one another's company and the food set before you, you forget who in the group this meal was really necessary for and who had other options. It's very fitting that we would have a potluck today. Everybody come. Load up your plate. Have a great time together. It's very fitting that in a week we'll host Family Promise because that's one of the times where we consistently experience that. A few families who are caught in homelessness and are needing food. Others who have prepared the food. And we all sit down together and just enjoy one another's company. What a gift when we just forget who are the ones who needed it and who are the ones who had other options. Jesus, you see, moves it to this level because that is what will change us. This story was never just about poor people getting help. It's about Jesus knowing exactly what kind of change we need and what will bring that about. You know, if the rich man had just ventured out or invited Lazarus in, Lazarus would have been fed. That'd be real important. Maybe he'd have gotten a good bath, better than what the, the dogs were able to offer. Could have gotten fed, clean, a little better clothes, and that's important. But the rich man could not have helped but be changed by it. And Jesus knows it. And so it is for us, too. 
And so may it be for us who hear his word. Amen. I invite you to stand. Our hymn is number 712.